welcome to the Space Shovel Podcast. My name is Sally, and I'll be your host today. This week's episode looks back at some of the best moments from the first six episodes in the series. I am here to guide you along your journey through each episode. Links to all of the episodes can be found in the description below. Episode 1. LIDAR IN YOUR POCKET The thing that came up into mind, and I know TLS is being utilized heavily in this area already, but it's now you're, you're, you could essentially give it to every detective or investigator is crime scene um, recreation, crime accident recreation. So what happens right now is when they have a, a major accident on a highway where somebody normally ends up losing their life, they have to do it for court purposes and, and yeah. everything else. They have to do an accident scene recreation. And so some departments have the ability to have a TLS scanner or something like that to be able to bring out, to scan the area. So now they have that 3D model, but now you can do it. Now it's like three dudes with their phones. Correct, like going out circle. and doing that. And if you think about just the court system, when you can now, you have a, a and I go gruesome, but you have a murder scene, right? Mm -hmm. And now you can essentially bring that murder scene up and have accurate measurements here and, it is and bring that in a three-dimensional way into a courtroom it's, it's right so, absolutely incredible so, so tyler that's a that's another great one so you follow the chronology right 20 years ago maybe 25 they had a person with a camera that had film in it right yeah <laughs> okay and they got to then develop the pictures from the film then it was a person with the camera and it was digital and they could take significantly more pictures and they're more accurate, et cetera. Correct. And then now they probably video them. But what you're saying is they would create the the 3D, three-dimensional virtual reality of that scene. And then probably the next step is once they have that, they can maybe play it backwards and show what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, going forward. So yeah, it's pretty cool. One thing that came to mind is is let's call it crowdsourcing of, I don't know, everything. So let's say that Google or probably Apple or somebody ends up creating an app where you could put your phone like on your your jacket as you're walking down Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then it automatically uploads Fifth Avenue in New York City up to a cloud. And let's say 20 people do that. There's some type of AI that sorts through everything. And suddenly you now have a near perfect... 3D reality of Fifth Avenue. And now let's say somebody else goes, hey, I think I'd like to take my Peloton down Fifth Avenue. <laughs> and you suddenly can take your Peloton down Fifth Avenue and you're in that virtual world. And eventually you can see it being Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, the East River, the Hudson River, Chicago, LA. And in my mind, I see like a bad pun virus spreading yes. <laughs> uh, across the country. And you could see that this crowdsourced 3D augmented reality, virtual reality of, I don't know, everywhere. Yeah, so it's also a little bit scary, right? Because if once everybody has a LIDAR in their pocket and, and or it's on every car or every street corner or every ring doorbell that's right. out there <laughs> or every camera, um, has a camera and a LIDAR, you know, right above it, you know, suddenly, you know, it, look, I'll be dead by the time that happens. So you guys have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, you can just kind of think about the, the scary scenarios where it's always, what if it gets in the wrong hands? Somebody has an accurate representation of a street. You think of the, the bombing that happened in Boston. And now you can go in, the, the wrong person can go in and say, I'm gonna put a bomb here, I'm gonna put a bomb here. It's gonna have the biggest effect. Um, so definitely some things on the, maybe the privacy side to think about yeah. there. Um, or, or manipulation of yeah. it. So back to your point, Tyler, where there's a crime scene and you believe you have a, a actual depiction of, of what happened based upon all the sensors that might be around and somebody hacks into the system and changes it and suddenly it's you know dan who's the bad guy. episode two new usps delivery vehicles i think it's interesting too that that I, I guess we haven't talked about is there was no discussion about natural gas when a lot of city buses nowadays 
or natural gas. Right. Um, so I got it. It's still a it's still fossil fuel somewhat, but it it burns cleaner than right. uh, petroleum. So I, it's interesting that that was not part of it yeah. that we've seen. Um, and that's one of the major points as to why they're moving to um, a the old trucks are old, but they're also producing a lot of emissions that these new vehicles hopefully don't produce. So now I have a thought of like, <laughs> what if, do you think they'll make those charging stations public? So now they have an opportunity to make potential money off of people that want to charge their electric vehicles at the post office. It's not about stamps anymore. Yeah. Uh, and that's a great, a great thought, Ian, and, and really in the spirit of this, uh, podcast of, hey, what about these second and third order and orthogonal effects? And so maybe so, maybe the Postal Service goes into the electric selling business and at your yeah. local post office, when the trucks aren't there during the day, you can come and plug your car in if you don't happen to be at work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Eight thoughts, stories of fires. You said that the the company that won, um, which is Oshkosh Defense or? Yes, Oshkosh. And you it, said there was some kind of link there, correct? Well, I think the difference is, so to Dan's point, the prior manufacturer was an aerospace defense, mm -hmm. whereas Oshkosh builds trucks for the military. Gotcha. So one of the trucks they build is a, a truck that supports the Marine Corps. It's called affectionately called the 7 Ton. Its official name is a medium vehicle uh, transport replacement or something similar to that. Yeah. And it's been a successful truck. I mean, I've, I've ridden in a couple times. I think the last time I rid, rode in one was from TQ to Camp Ramadi. And uh, so it, it was it was a workhorse in, yeah. in Iraq and I, and I believe Afghanistan, but probably by the time we were in Afghanistan, it was more MRAPs. Yeah. But the point being, this company builds vehicles, cars and trucks, vice airplanes. Airplanes, right. Well, and, and they have at least some knowledge, I would suspect, of building vehicles that are relentless and can take a lot of abuse, uh, like Marines driving and or riding in them, <laughs> um, as well as understanding what it takes to uh, work with a government specification and work in the government contracting field. And, you know, so that probably gave them a leg up. I'm hopeful that they're man uh, that they'll leverage technology from other parts of the automobile and truck industry and they won't invent an engine and won't invent a transmission and won't invent braking systems but they'll pick and choose and bolster and improve things that are already out there. episode three covid tech uh so let's talk let's start local and talk about um something that i mentioned in the description um dan i don't know if you've seen this the southern maryland loves you hot box i think is what they're calling it i have not um, seen it but i'm ready to learn okay so this is a <clears throat> and i'm not going to do it justice so if you're listening to this podcast i encourage you to go to the southern maryland loves you website and learn all about this but it's a hot box that you can basically put outside of any building. I don't know if it goes inside or not. I don't think so. I think it, it usually like sits in a parking lot. You can um, wheel carts of PPE into mm. um, this hot box. It then um, heats up obviously uh, and 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 sterilizes the PPE that way. What, what is it used for an energy source? Is it plugged in? I, I wanna say that Techport partnered with maybe a local um, heating and air conditioning company mm -hmm. to create the heat source. Okay. And I want to say booth maybe Birch oil okay. is I one of their partners. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's probably like a propane. Okay. Um, yep. So something more sophisticated than they just like dump gas on it and yes. set it on fire. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, the idea is that you can reuse this PV. Right. So you wheel it in, they heat it up to whatever that safe temperature is. It's then able to be reused in the future. Now this was, Really, really great during the start of the COVID pandemic because obviously we had mass shortages, mm -hmm. glove shortages. Obviously, I don't think you could reuse gloves, but shortages of, of materials. Now, the spin that they have, and it's a good spin, is that it will also in the future save um, the environment basically on pollution because now you can reuse masks and they have an exact number, I think, on their website of how many times they can reuse masks. Um, so that's one cool thing locally that came out of the pandemic. I'm sure there's more locally. I just don't know of them. Um, but they're really pushing 
um, to 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 continue to use this hot box in in different applications. So I don't know too much about the I mean, what is it mRNA mm-hmm. messenger um, RNA mRNA. Okay. So is it? Can you just give a quick breakdown of what it is? Because I I, under, I understand I can get context clues, but just. You, Dumb it down in like two two sentences, <laughs> two, yeah, two I'll, very I'll, long I'll, sentences. I'll dumb, it, I'll dumb it way 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 down, and then Kane will no, no, make no, it better. No, no. <laughs> it, it takes the RNA, which is like DNA's second cousin okay. of the virus. It takes a little piece of it, M, the messenger, and they've figured out a way to get your body to react as if it were reacting to a full virus by just having this little tiny gotcha. piece of the virus. And they've got the right piece of the virus that um, prompts your body to react as if it were the whole virus. Okay. And so it's, you know, it's giving you two chicken nuggets instead of 10, just so that you know what chicken nuggets taste like and your body can react. So it's it's basically, we all have this built-in defense system. It's, it's triggering that defense system that defense system and then allowing our bodies to build the antibodies without actually injecting you with the virus right, correct. just the just the appropriate piece of the virus to get your body to react yeah is that that's the way i understand it as well. yeah yes okay cool <clears throat> yeah I, I like i said there were context clues i was like oh i get this and then i was like well let's just see exactly what yeah it is. and so so but now you know there are genetic components i think to many, many other diseases. Mm-hmm. Now, all right, well, can you do that and somehow get your right. body to react to fight that or back muscular, to muscular dystrophy, Parkinson's? What, yeah. what can we what can we address with this? Yeah. Right. That'll right. be interesting to see how that develops into the future. Right. Um, because so it'll you know we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Episode four: Deconstructing the Perseverance Rover. Yeah the the whole the, the whole genesis of this topic with the rover uh, with uh, when it, when it was first landing and it was on TV, it struck me that somebody at NASA was smart enough, wise enough, and um, I'll say cool enough that they said, hey, why don't we put a camera in the parachute so we can take a selfie of ourselves landing on Mars? So with the vast complexity of all that came into getting – the perseverance from here to there and having it work with all the advanced technology. Somebody said, Hey, let's put a camera in the parachute so we can watch ourselves do this. And it just struck me as cool and weird and somebody with really forward thinking because Holy cow, that visual from the parachute of, of the, uh, the machine landing on Mars real time it was like a 90 second best commercial in the history of NASA <laughs> for NASA. It was cool. So, and so that started this whole thing. And then the other technologies and here we are. Yeah. Well, I mean, for, for having been on a lot of these planning meetings and, and, uh, in the past, don't burst my bubble, Jeff. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> don't burst my bubble. No. Like, no, what I'm going to say is, um, a, a while back, I can promise you some engineer asked the managers, Let's put a camera on this. No, no, we can't do that. We don't right. have the weight. We don't have the space. And they've just kept on persevering. Yes. <laughs> uh, until one. until somebody said, all right, we'll put a camera on there. Right. We're going to put, I mean, this rover has 30 some odd different right. kinds of cameras on it. We'll put one on this. We'll get the selfie shot you've been asking for for 10 years. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I think this has been out there. Yeah. And Tur- now so somebody, a manager finally said yes. Right. It turns out the engineers were right all along that the coolness factor outweighs the, well, it probably would have been three or four or five pounds then. Now it's probably measured in ounces for a camera. So let's talk about, um, I have a visual, I can show you guys a visual of the rover here. Let's talk about the, um, the oxygen mechanism that's on there. So Jeff, do you want to give a quick right. review of so, that? So uh, it's kind of an old concept of Going back to the old term of terraforming, I mean, how, how how do you take an atmosphere that's not hospitable to humans and making it hospitable? Right. And and people have been talking about it for years, but uh, that's one of the I think the one other than the um, the helicopter, 
is one of the coolest things that are, it's not getting a lot of press, but how do you take carbon dioxide and work with it and turn it into oxygen so that it can be used not only for humans, but maybe rocket fuel or something else. And it's, it, I think it's, it's exciting because mm -hmm. it has never been done before. There's a lot of firsts on this particular rover and that's one of them. Yeah. What movie was that with Arnold Schwarzenegger where they made, he was like, he was, shoot, I can't remember it. They were on a planet and they had to be in a bubble, but then they made the atmosphere. At oh, the that was uh Total Recall. Total I Recall, think. that's yeah. exactly what it was. Say, yeah. You're yeah. looking at the wrong guy for yeah. that movie. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a lot of the same kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's this little box that, I, and I don't, I'm sure a lot of it's pri pri proprietary, but right. um, can it be done? There's a lot of firsts with this particular rover. Can it be done or not? I mean, holy cow, think of, think of the applications of that right. on this planet. If we can turn CO2 into oxygen, you know, appropriately applied, you potentially have, you know, a greenhouse gas transformation activity. You know, uh, when you buy your car, for example, you know, they slap on the CO2 to O2 uh, device and you are able to be neutral. You right now have a neutral carbon footprint, a CO2 footprint as you sort of wander around. I don't know. So there's a lot of different applications that if this comes to be and they can make it work and then shrinkify it and cheapify it like we're able to do with most things, uh, you have a real a real possibility here. Yeah. I mean, even so CO2 is, I'm not a scientist, CO2 is the um, kind of aftermath of our breathing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, think about like we're grabbing and I assume there's a, a certain amount of CO2 in the air that we breathe too. Is that mm -hmm. it's, okay? Um, think about just like these, now we have buildings that are sucking in air, basically pulling out the CO2 and pushing out just oxygen, oxygen only. So now we're, we're battling basically pollution at that point. Right. Um, where like you're saying, we could also neutralize it by just slapping devices on, on cars or, it can be like a new kind of catalytic converter. I right. Mean, exactly. You, you can you can throw it into factories and instead of yeah. emitting that that they're emitting oxygen. I right. Mean, and and who who says it has to be eliminated uh, contained just to oxygen? It can be maybe even any kind of gas you want. Right. Maybe you can turn it into helium, and then you can go use uh, the commercial applications to helium. Right. Of course, I'm sure that's probably a whole, that's a whole nother element, so. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and, and, you know, CO2 to oxygen, right, is one of the main things that trees, are yes. the benefits of the trees. Yep. All right, so if you're a paper company or a box company, uh, for every tree you chop down, you got to buy three of these things and set them up in a field somewhere, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. All right, well, let's hope it works. Yes, right. absolutely. And then we can patent that idea, and Avian is now in the CO2 to oxygen business. Yeah, uh, <laughs> count me in as a, as a partial company owner with everybody else here as, and part of the ESOP. Uh, I'm in on making a $10 billion. Episode 5, Flying Cars. But when, when we think about flying cars, I mean, for me, I think about the cars that always had the wings and it, it kind of just looked like a plane, um, which might be a good place to start off this conversation. Where do we, where do we cut the line in the sand for what, what we classify as a flying car and what we classify just as like another helicopter or, or um, kind of VTOL system? Uh there's no difference. Yeah. Uh, no. There is a difference. Okay. And I well, beg to differ. All right. Well, go ahead. <laughs> Tracy, over to you. Go a ahead. VTOL only um, does vertical takeoff and landing. The idea behind a, a uh, flying car is that you drive it on the road, and then you can take it off in the air, transfer wherever you're going to go, right. and then land vertically and drive back on the, car, on the ground again. So it puts a, another element of complexity into the innovation that some of the companies out there are trying to do right now. Yeah, so I would agree with that. I think Tracy's right. I will say that I believe the press interchanges those two words yes. um, and those two thoughts as if they're the same thing. So yes, you're right. You're 100% right. A flying car is just as you said. They're calling the eVTOL a flying car right. a la the Jetsons, right? If who's yep. old enough to know the Jetsons. <laughs> um and, and therein lies the trick, right? An eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing, boy, that's a sporty proposition. And that is, 
there's a lot there there. Tracy, your point is great about uh, your family member in the 50s talking about helicopters mm-hmm. being, you know, the transportation of the future. Well, it is for some people. Mm-hmm. The very, very, very wealthy travel by helicopter mm-hmm. in cities because they can. Mm-hmm. The average person, uh, count me as somebody who's never taken a helicopter <laughs> in New York City or anywhere else except you should over, next time you're yeah, there. <laughs> over Niagara Falls, which was, in, you know, kind of cool, just as a side note. Um, there are a lot of things to overcome. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, the technical challenges, the, the human being challenges mm-hmm. of, of having the confidence to get on something that's going to fly and go fast and maybe or maybe not have a pilot there, mm-hmm. uh, that's tricky. Yeah. Pe- people are, are, are wary of getting in a self-driving car mm-hmm. now. Right. So, so uh, Ian, I'll ask you, if you were in Phoenix on your golf trip in February in Scottsdale, and you 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 called up an Uber because maybe you had more than one beer. Right. So you called up your Uber, <laughs> and the self-driving autonomous Uber showed up. Would you get in or not get in? Depends how much you drank. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I also, I think, I think my answer personally would be yes, I'd get in, just because... I want the experience of that. And would you be like the Mars rover and take a selfie of yourself? I think I would. I think I would post it on the Instagram page. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in a self-driving car. Somebody get me. (laughs) Would they think there's going to be a bar in the back seat of the self-driving car? Like a limo. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Is it a vending machine? It's a vending machine where you have to swipe your credit card and out pops like a seven dollar (laughs) Heineken. Yes. (laughs) We're almost there with cars. I I mean, almost is a very relative uh, term, but. Um, what what do you think we could learn from the process of figuring out how to make fully autonomous vehicles and apply that to uh, fully autonomous self drive or self flying cars? So yeah, you can get in right now. I don't. It might be Las Vegas. It might be Arizona. I don't remember exactly. But there's somewhere that has a fully autonomous autonomous taxi. You get in. I don't know if it's application driven or you type it in like you said once you get into it. But it's like this minivan that you just get in. Type in your location or where you want to go, and it takes you there. Um, obviously, there's things we can apply from what we're learning in that into these flying cars, but is there anything specific that you guys can think of? Trace? So there, I'm familiar with a, a couple of um, companies out in Silicon Valley. Um, mm-hmm. One, Neuropropulsion Systems, um, has developed a mathematical algorithm that um, increases your range accuracy and range ability in the vehicle. And they, I think they just launched last month or two months ago. But anyway, um, this mathematical algorithm can do that for you. And they put it on a car to do autonomous driving. Um, they can even look a, uh, around the corner, which is very oh, cool. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty innovative stuff. So there's companies out there doing those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, now put that in the air in a three-dimensional uh, environment, Harder. Um, very hard, uh, right. and you know how software software is. We still haven't imperfect. Fig- we still <laughs> haven't figured out how to manage and develop software properly. Right. Um, but there's a lot of companies out there investing a whole lot of money, like Toyota and mm. uh, and, a, and a bunch of different venture capitals, as you mentioned, yeah. that are are really going to see this. Now, I will tell you that um, I had a family member uh, <clears throat> back in the 50s and 60s who invested in helicopters because he thought it was going to be the transportation solution to the world. Right. You're going to land on top of buildings. And yeah, where is that gone? Exa- uh, right? Exactly. So, so public perception and the fear of flying is mm-hmm. real. It, yep. And um, they do it in New York quite a bit, but it's, you know, it's congested in New York. There's buildings right. in your way, right? So um, they're, they have very narrow corridors that you have to fly around in and and um, flight paths. And, and so it's not, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it happening just yet. Um, the European uh, Agency, Aviation Safety Agency, mm-hmm. I think, is um, is actually approaching it by building blocks um, and coming up with um, stepping stones kind of to develop certification process for both the air vehicle and the pilot or the drone operator or whatever right. you're going to call it. Um, back to what you said about the press, right? They call all sorts of things drones. Right. There's only one drone I know of. It's being right. dragged behind an aircraft. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. So, right. yeah. So terminology has to be there. Um, and uh, public understanding has to be part of it. Um, you know, n- 
let's just put the flying part aside and the challenges there. What about these vertiports in your backyard? Everybody yeah. hates the sound of aircraft. Well, these are, that's hence the E VTOL because mm-hmm. they're quiet and they kind of whisper along. I, I don't know. It's, there are a lot of challenges. And for those people out there that might be listening, take everything you read <laughs> coming out of the venture capitalist with a grain of salt. One guy said, and I'm going to put my old guy glasses on. One guy said, owning a VTOL could be as affordable as owning a bicycle. All right. Well, that's categorically right. not going to happen. Grandchildren, maybe. <laughs> Episode six, hoverboards and drones. My biggest thing would be falling into the props and being blindered. So <laughs> yeah, as long as we could avoid that. Yeah. So and what about the people yeah. who are like 40 feet below you who get your blender leaving <laughs> <laughs> after you've been blendered? And somebody throws up on the tilt whirl right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody right. around it is the ones that, yeah. You know, you're going to be going, there's no corridors, right? So you're flying right over the... You know, the giant parking lot, you know, the supermarket, and there's like a mom with her two kids, and all of a sudden you're blendered above her and just, just poosh. I don't know, man. There's some chain link fence over those props or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, honestly, seeing in our line of work, we've seen drones land in all different sorts of configurations they weren't supposed to ever be in, and they actually get back pretty darn good. It's It takes a pretty hard failure to actually down one of those. All right, so in the movie Back to the Future, we all remember the essentially flying skateboards, the hoverboards, uh, which were cool and just really used to get from point A to point B. Fast forward or backwards uh, a bunch of years, and here we are with drones becoming more and more common, not quite ubiquitous, but getting there. Uh, You guys have a lot of experience with drones. So if you were to guess a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, where are we going to be with common everyday usage of drones? You know, there's this vision of Amazon drones flying everywhere, you know, dropping off uh, Twix bars and toilet paper and auto parts in your front on your front door. Is that really going to happen? What, what do you guys think? Well, it's entirely possible. I mean, we're almost to that point now and as far as people flying them around for recreation, right, with cameras and whatnot. Um, so as far as, as far as commercial... Uh, availability of drones. I think it's just a matter of time. Um, the technology is definitely there. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, the Navy kind of sees where this is going. I and mean, we're testing a cargo UAV down at uh, Pax River at Webster Field, where we work at UX24. that actually delivers parts from Navy ship to Navy ship. So um, we have a big demo in July kind of demonstrating that technology right now. So, how, how big is it? Uh, so it is max gross weight is 150 pounds. It can carry up to 25 pounds. It's got about a 18 foot wingspan. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, it's it's technology coming. Navy's finally coming on board with it. The other services have been on board with drone technology for for over a decade now. Um, and so it, the military definitely sees the the future in it. What's the range on on the one you're talking about, roughly? So it can fly for about seven to eight hours at okay. 60 knots. Um, so it was about three, 400 miles. Okay. Um, so yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, for sure with, uh, technology getting smaller and smaller, um, you know, especially software, firmware availability to cuts, uh, being able to purchase more easier, um, it's definitely going to get easier just for a consumer to build stuff. Um, for an example, like they're already doing, um, commercially cargo delivery with the wing. Um, out near Virginia, they're actually delivering uh, like cookies and textbooks that you can. They, they're flying around the college near Virginia Tech um, area, which is quite fascinating. It's a VTOL um, aircraft that actually has a little like bucket that goes down on a string and drops the bucket and then takes back off and goes pretty much autonomously. But um, I mean, only for year to year, the technology is going to get smaller and more efficient. You know, different ways of. Increasing battery life, fuel economy, and aircraft already doing, you know, 45-hour flights um, nonstop is only going to get better and better. And same thing could be applied to hoverboards. There's guys now doing, you know, little quads that are hovering a couple feet above the ground and down the line is only going to get more efficient over time. It's definitely a possibility that it'll there be commercially available for anyone to use. So, so what? when are the lawyers going to get involved here? So what's going to happen... And suddenly the lawyers aren't going to get involved and like put the brakes on everything. Like you're talking about the uh, down at Virginia Tech. Like what if what if it misses? What if it what if something drops out of the sky and lands on like you know some fourth grader in a playground? Thank you for watching. Next week, Ian will regain control. I mean, 
hosting duties for a brand new Space Shovel episode.